very impressed and therefore a little bit ashamed of what I have to offer, which is of a more theoretical nature. Oh, by the way, good afternoon from Vienna and good morning to all the participants from overseas. <laughs> good. Okay, so chalkboard motion. I realize that the title is not very informative, but I, I do hope that I will succeed in making things a little bit more clear. Now, so uh, this talk is about moving ellipsoids in phase space or ellipses in phase plane in a more uh, particular setting and uh, quantum counterparts, which are Gaussian states in configuration space. So the main remark is that mathematical points do not have any operative meaning in physics, be it classical or quantum. Points live in a realm of pure mathematics and are epistemologically inaccessible. As my colleague and friend Jean-Pierre Gazot notes, nothing is mathematically exact from the physical point of view. Well, I find it's more or less true, but of course this can be discussed. I'm not a philosopher of science here. So what is however accessible to us are pictorial approximations, like the chalk dots on a blackboard to take one very naive example. We will see that chopper motions have interesting characteristics which can be used to simplify, which is important, many arguments, arguments in both classical and quantum and semi-classical mechanics. So in traditional classical and quantum mechanics, it is assumed that the Hamiltonian function or its quantization is given and one thereafter sets out to solve the corresponding dynamical equations. Hamilton or Schrödinger, but we all know that it's very difficult and impossible in most cases to obtain exact solutions. So we have to content ourselves with numerical approximations or, or approximation methods and so on. Here, this talk, we will reverse this paradigm by considering the primary objects as being motions, classical or quantum. These motions are not defined by their actions on points, but rather on ellipsoids with constant symplectic capacity. Uh, I'm going to explain in some detail what a symplectic capacity is a little bit later, but let's say if you take the case of one degree of freedom, that is a phase plane, symplectic capacity is area. In higher dimensions, it's not volume, but okay. Later, uh, more about that later. So there's great freedom in choosing these motions, justifying our use of the metaphor chalkboard motion. These motions can be compared to chalk drawings on a blackboard, leaving a continuous succession of thick points. The surprising fact, and this is actually the main point of this talk here, is that chalkboard motions are indeed always Hamiltonian, but in a very simple and unexpected way. We will be able to construct such motions at will exactly as when one stands in front of a blackboard and uses a piece of chalk to make a drawing, except that in our case, the blackboard is infinite, of course, and multidimensional. Good, so let's, uh, well, yes, this talk is based here on the papers one and two, which are quite recent, they appeared a few months ago here, and also for the symplectic part to a joint paper with the Diaz and Prata, from Lisbon about the maximal covariance group of Wigner transforms here also. So these are references. If you're interested in the PDFs, I can send them to you. Yeah. Good, so some notation. We will equip the phase space R2n with a standard symplectic structure. That is sigma z of z prime equals to px prime minus p prime x. Uh, in dimension n equal to one is just the minus the determinant. I've chosen that con that uh, uh, convention here, where z is xp, position and momentum. And in matrix notation, you can express that using the standard matrix, the standard symplectic matrix j. I think that this is quite uh, well known here among the mathematical physics community here. And Okay, a matrix is symplectic or belongs to the symplectic group if and only if the transpose of S in the last line times J times S equals to J. The second equality is actually equivalent here. So the symplectic group, well, working in the canonical basis, SPN is the group of all 2N, 2N 
matrices generated by J and the matrices ML. So ML here is essentially a rescaling. And you rescale uh, positions by L minus one and you then have to rescale momenta using LT. And VP, uh, the VPs are called simplectic shears, sometimes in the literature here. Uh, they have a precise optical uh, interpretations. Uh, well, what happens when you change of change the refractive medium in uh, the geometrical propagation of light rays here? And okay, L must be invertible and P symmetric here. Then the affine symplectic group is essentially the semi direct product of R to N by SPN. That is, it consists actually of all the products of the type st z naught equivalent t of s z naught s here. That is, you transform and you translate, or you translate first and you transform thereafter. Okay, in block name matrix notations, if I if I write the symplectic matrix as a b c d, where the blocks are of dimension n times n, we have s in s p n if and only if the relations one or equivalently two are satisfied. This is well known. These relations are called the Lüneburg relations in optics, sometimes good for them. And the inverse of the symplectic matrix S is then given by the formula three, which you see there. This is quite remarkable because the formula for the inverse is practically the one for the inverse of a two times two matrix with determinant one. So it is in a sense a watermark here. Uh, symplectic geometry or symplectic matrices mimic the behavior of two times two matrices. Uh, this is very important because it leads in a sense then to the notion of symplectic capacity we'll discuss. Good. Now, symplectic isotope, isotopies. Well, that, that is a simple concept. It's a symplectic isotopy is just a C1 path of matrices ST in SPN starting from the identity at time equal to zero. So writing ST in N, N block matrix form, ST equal to AT, BT, CT, DT, and S naught equal to the identity, we have the following results here. ST is automatically the phase flow determined by a quadratic Hamiltonian, namely the one given by formula here. And it's explicitly given then by formula 6 there, which expresses the coefficients in terms of the matrices A, T, B, T, and so on, and their derivatives. So this means actually that whatever is the path you choose in the symplectic group, which started from the identity at time t equal to zero, it is, it is automatically a Hamiltonian path. Uh, by the way, the same result remains true if you replace the ST by canonical transformations. That is, if you go over to the nonlinear case. Same thing, if you take a so-called Hamiltonian isotopy, then it, it is automatically associated with a Hamiltonian, which is not quadratic in general, of course. These are well-known results from symplectic topology. I'm not sure that Everybody knows them in other areas, but okay, this is important. Good. Now I define a subgroup of SPN, which I call the local symplectic group. So let L, well, actually, the first lines, you don't have to, to bother so much about them here. Uh, the local complex, the local symplectic group SP naught N consists of or is generated by the matrices uh, ML and V minus P or VP. Actually, it's the group of all products of such matrices. For instance, you see V minus P ML is given by a certain matrix. Uh, in the upper right, the upper right corner is zero in both cases. So in a sense, the local symplectic group consists of all symplectic matrices when, which when written in block matrix form have a zero in the upper corner. Actually, on a slightly more theoretical level, it means that these matrices belong to the stabilizer of the vertical polarization, that is, of the 
P plane or the P space. But okay, never mind. What is important is to see that we have elements like that. So why do I call this subgroup a local subgroup? To understand that, we have to wait until I talk about the metaplectic group. You see, these local symplectic matrices correspond to those metaplectic operators which are local, that is, which contain no Fourier transform. Okay, we'll talk more about that later. Notice in the two last lines we have product formulas which are quite elementary, but which we will use without further, further comment in the rest of this talk. Yeah. Good, now the unitary group. It turns out that the usual unitary group can be embedded inside the symplectic group using a certain monomorphism. If I take a unitary matrix U equal to X plus I Y, then I define capital U by the block matrix, matrix X Y minus Y X here. And using the Lunable relations I mentioned, you can verify that these matrices capital U are indeed symplectic as well. So the monomorphism five allows us to identify the usual unitary group with a subgroup UN of SPN. And it's an easy exercise to show that actually UN consists of symplectic rotations, that is of matrices which are both symplectic and belong to the rotation group here. Good, so this is very important. Also, yeah, by the way, yeah, the group UN is a maximal compact subgroup of the symplectic group. So it means actually that the symplectic group is contractible to UN from which you deduce various properties of SPN. Uh, for, for instance, you can calculate the, the first homotopy group and see that it's the same as that of UN and so on and so on, but we will not need these, need these uh, properties here. Yeah. Now, okay, combining the local symplectic group and the unitary group, we obtain what is called the Iwazawa or pre-Iwazawa factorization. So it turns out that every symplectic matrix S can be written as a product of an element of SP naught N and of a symplectic rotation. More precisely, you have the formula seven there, saying that every S can be written as a product V minus P, ML, and then a unitary matrix, V minus P, ML, U, X, Y, where the P, L, and X are easily calculated explicitly using the formulas A, 9, 10. Well, to verify that is just uh, an exercise in, in algebra. That P is symmetric is not immediately obvious, but if you work, uh, if you work a little bit harder, you, you can verify that quite easily. Also, you verify that AAT plus BBT is indeed invertible. It's a positive definite matrix here, and that X and Y are given by the other formulas there. So, it's, a very, it's the pre-Iwazawa factorization because the Iwazawa factorization, the true one, gives some more information on the matrix P, but we will not need that here at all. Yeah. Good, so the main observation now, from which everything, almost everything stems here. Uh, let's denote by B2N epsilon, the ball in R2N centered at the origin and with radius epsilon positive. I write epsilon instead of R because epsilon in practical applications will be small. So it's just a, intended to be a suggestive notation here. And we have an immediate consequence of the pre Iwazawa factorization. It's quite trivial, but essential. For every S in SPN, we can find a unique S naught in the local symplectic group such that the action of S on the ball is equal to the action of S naught on B2 and Epsilon. I'm saying it's totally trivial. Yes, of course it's trivial because S B2 and Epsilon is equal to S naught U, U being a symplectic rotation, B2 N. Yeah, but hmm, the ball being invariant by rotations, U of B2 N is just B2 N, so we get this equality. More generally, for this you need very little Algebra, extra algebra. If you take a ball 
centered at a point z naught of phase space, then s b to n z naught epsilon will be equal to t s z naught s naught b to n epsilon. You have to juggle a little bit with translations and you immediately get this formula here. So you see, by applying symplectic matrices to balls, you can make the, the unitary part disappear. And so you remain just with the local part. Okay, chalkboard motion one. So that, this is to illustrate this principle. So I take a H equal to a time dependent quadratic form, generalized time dependent harmonic oscillator here, where M is a real symmetric 2N to N matrix depending continuously on T. I don't assume that M is uh, positive, definite, or anything here. So the associated Hamilton equations can be written as z dot equal to j m t z and these are linear and hence a solution z t of the associated Hamilton equations satisfies z t equal to s t z naught with s t in s p n. Now we know that the flow determined by linear Hamiltonian equations is always symplectic, consists of symplectic matrices. Now for every t in R we have s t equal to s naught t u naught t where s naught t is in the local symplectic group and u naught t is a symplectic rotation and thus we get s t b to n epsilon equal to s naught t b to n epsilon this is exactly what i showed in the last slides it means that if you move a ball centered at the origin using a symplectic flow, you can replace this symplectic flow just by a flow of local symplectic uh, matrices here. More generally, then, you can say that ST is, uh, you see that ST times the ball, applied to the ball centered at Z naught, will give also S naught T, local symplectic flow, applied to the ball centered at u naught t z naught. It's true that the unitary part has not disappeared totally here, but it's only at the level of the center of the ball it appears. Okay, so this is what we call a chalkboard motion here. So this motion can be studied using only the explicit formulas in the Iwasawa factorization. And if you do some calculations using the formula giving given the, 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 the Hamiltonian knowing the symplectic isotopy, you can show that S dot T is the flow of what I call the reduced Hamiltonian function HRZT. Observe this. This is very uh, nice and surprising. You see, the, it means that you can actually replace the Hamiltonian H, the full Hamiltonian H, by a Hamiltonian where you do not have any kinetic term. There is no term in P squared here. It is as if this kinetic term had been absorbed by the symplectic rotation. And HR, the, simple, the, uh, the coefficients here in HR are easily calculated using the Iwasawa uh, decomposition, and they are given by the formulas, the two last formulas on this slide here. And this is true actually for arbitrary flows. If you limit yourself to the local flow, which is the only thing which interests you, if you want to study the motion of balls or ellipsoids, then the kinetic term will be absent. And of course, the Hamilton, the Hamilton equations here for HR are very easy to solve. Let me give an example here. Let's take n equal to 1. So we have a phase plane here and the free particle Hamiltonian. One. It's a very simple Hamiltonian, but of course you can solve explicitly the Hamilton equations in a very trivial and known way. But applying Isawa, Iwasawa, you get the formula there. ST, the first matrix, is then the local part, and UXE is then the rotation part. And the reduced Hamiltonian you obtain is then given by the formula you have below, which is admittedly much more complicated than the initial Hamiltonian. And the, again here, the kinetic term, hmm, is, I mean, the initial Hamiltonian was purely kinetic, but in the reduced case, 
there's no more kinetic term here. Good. Fine. So, Chokpal Moksha 2. Now we're going to, to something which is a little bit more difficult and complicated, actually, which motivated my, my study of these things here. We reverse the argument. This we consider a time t equal to zero, a ball centered at some point z naught with radius epsilon, which gets, as time evolves, continuously displaced and deformed into an ellipsoid using a continuous one parameter family kt of elements of gl to nr. Now, uh, just to, to, to make the general idea a little bit simpler, in the case n equal to one, say we have a disk, a circle with disk with radius epsilon. What I do, well, I have drawn that on the blackboard and I displace that disk in an arbitrary way along the blackboard while deforming it and keeping the area of this deformed ball constant. I deform it into an ellipsoid. But then, very surprisingly, the, the motion is automatically Hamiltonian here. So it means that whatever you do with a small ball or an ellipsoid, whatever you do with it on the blackboard or here in the more general phase space, the motion you get is Hamiltonian, provided that in the plain case, the area remains constant. And in the general case, the symplectic capacity remains constant. I'm going to explain in next slides what the symplectic capacity is, something here. That is, there exists a quadratic Hamiltonian. Yes, in addition, that kind of motion, if you deform the ball here into ellipses, the motion will always be associated with a quadratic Hamiltonian function here. Yeah. So uh, I insist this property is very important because it means, roughly speaking, that everything is Hamiltonian motion, which is not obvious from the beginning, and which is not obvious at all if I reduced the disk or the ball to a point, because it's not obvious at all that any motion in the plane or the phase space is Hamiltonian. So what is this question? Yes. Yes. Does this theorem apply to all of these ellipses, uh, all of these ellipsoidal trajectories simultaneously or just for one of them, for a fixed, uh, a given Z0? Uh, no, it no. no, it applies, it applies to, well, uh, no. If you have one Z naught here, and if you deform it, well, then you will get a, the deformation of that ball will be Hamiltonian. It says nothing of what happens to other balls centered at other points. Actually, each of these balls will have its own Hamiltonian. Very good question, actually. Thank you. So the behavior is very local, actually. Uh, but, well, uh, I take up your remark a little bit later again, because there is a way you can actually globalize that. Because that's using a theorem due to, uh, due to Boothby. But it's a little bit more complicated, but we could do it global. Good. OK, so what is a symplectic capacity? Well, the symplectic capacity on phase space assigns to every subset, omega of r to n, a number, positive or zero, or infinite, such that you have the four properties below that hole here. Monotonicity, if you increase the set, then the, the symplectic capacity will increase as well. Symplectic invariance. If F belongs to simp n, yeah, what, what's simp n? Simp n is just a group of all symplectomorphisms, or if you prefer, in physical language, of all canonical transformations. Uh, a canonical transformation or symplectomorphism is a diffeomorphism whose Jacobian matrix is symplectic at every point here. So, symplectic capacity does not change under symplectomorphisms, it's an invariant. Then conformality. If you increase the size of omega by a factor of lambda, then the symplectic capacity increases by a factor of lambda squared. This is reminiscent of the properties of areas here. Mm -hmm. And then non-triviality. And this is really the marvelous thing here. 
is that the symplectic capacity of the ball b to n r is pi r squared but this is also the symplectic capacity of the full cylinder zj to nr. That is, it means that by the monotonicity property, if you have a ball and if you have a br and if you have a cylinder just surrounding this ball, tangent to this ball here, then every set which is between the ball and the cylinder will have the same capacity, symplectic capacity, pi r squared. I'm going to restate uh, the, these properties in a more convincing way in a moment here. But let me just say that the proof of the existence of a single symplectic capacity is extremely difficult. And actually, the first symplectic capacities that were constructed follow from uh, Gromov's non-squeezing theorem here. And this, this symplectic non-squeezing theorem can be uh, uh, stated as follows. There's one, one, uh, uh, one version of it, the theorem of Gromov and Eliasberg. If you take a symplectic morphism F and consider the projection, orthogonal projection, pi j of phase space, onto the plane of xj pj coordinates then the area of this projection on this plane is never smaller than pi r squared it means that uh, this actually seems to contradict liouville's theorem because you know liouville's theorem says that yeah okay uh, canonical transformations are volume preserving uh, that we all know, but but uh, volume preserving does not mean shape preserving, of course. So one could imagine of, uh, I mean, if you apply just bluntly Euwil's theorem, you will be able to transform a ball, for instance, into a very thin sausage or something like that, whose projection on any plane could a priori be as small as you want. But Gromov's theorem says that no, if these volume preserving Diffomorphism are symplectic, then you cannot reduce arbitrarily the size of the projection. You see, if you take in formula 12, if you take f equal to the identity, of course, the area of the projection of the ball on any plane x, j, p, j is pi r squared. And this does not change if you deform b to n r this ball using symplectomorphism. You will never reduce the area of the projection here. So uh, actually, uh, uh, Gromov uh, stated his original theorem in terms of uh, balls and cylinders, as in Formula 11. And uh, you can verify using the theorem below that C min of omega, given by the formula here on the right side, all in, really satisfies all the properties of a symplectic capacity using Gromov's theorem. So these are very subtle things. They are not so well known by the figure in the physics community yet, because well, the, result, the result is rather new. It, this was developed in the, from 1985. Gromov's original paper was in 1985, and these developments occurred in the 1990s. And symplectic topology is still a very active area of research in, in, in pure mathematics and in, in, in topology in, in general here. Actually, the notion of symplectic capacity can be used also to reformat the uncertainty principle. I've done that in a series of papers. I have a few more words to say about that in a moment, I think, here. Okay, so of particular interest for us are ellipsoids. So there exist infinitely many symplectic capacities, but it turns out that they all agree on phase space ellipsoid. And it's calculated as follows. Suppose our ellipsoid omega is defined by the inequality mz squared smaller or equal to r squared, where m is a positive definite matrix here. Uh, mz squared means mz times z, or zt mz if you prefer here. By Williamson's symplectic diagonalization theorem, we know that there exists a symplectic matrix 
such that STMS is diag diagonal. Yeah. Lambda, zero, zero, lambda, where lambda itself is diagonal and its entries are the symplectic eigenvalues of M. Uh, symplectic eigenvalues of M are the numbers, lambda j, sigma, which are positive, and such that plus minus i, lambda j, sigma, are the eigenvalues of jm. You see, jm has the same eigenvalues as the square root of m, j, times the square root of m. So they are of the type plus or minus i, lambda here. Knowing this, you then have that the symplectic capacity of any ellipsoid is given by pi r squared divided by lambda max, where lambda max is the largest symplectic eigenvalue of m. This is a standard formula. It's a very useful one also. You can verify that in the case where you have a circle, for instance, if you work in dimension n equal to 1, you get the usual formula uh, pi r squared divided by, okay, this is elementary high school geometry then here. Good, so our theorem, the theorem I stated a moment ago, now falls from the following property. If I take a, an invertible matrix of order to n, such that ck of omega is equal to c omega for every ellipsoid, then k is either symplectic, that is k is in SPN, or anti-symplectic, which means that k transpose jk is equal to minus j. The proof of this lemma is not trivial at all. It was, uh, I have given it with my colleagues from uh, Prata and uh, Diaz from uh, Lisbon, uh, uh, a new proof of that. It was proved in a more general scope by Elias Berg and, and other people. But it's not trivial either way here. And it implies the following theorem. If we take a family, Ft, of C1 diffeomorphisms of R to N, such that F naught is equal to the identity, and such that the symplectic capacities of all the Ft omega are the same for every ellipsoid omega, then Ft is a Hamiltonian flow here. So I don't even here have a, a linear statement. I state that this is true in all cases here. And if the FT are affine mappings, then H is a quadratic polynomial. This is the key to the, the general definition of chalkboard motion. This really shows that whatever you do, however you deform an ellipsoid into other ellipsoids using a flow, then this would be an Hamiltonian flow. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, okay, so just let's go a little bit beyond then. Uh, the linear or affine case and uh, and see how we can approximate that kind of result for arbitrary Hamiltonians. And for this, I have to recall a little bit what the nearby orbit approximation is here. Uh, it's a well-known method in um, semi-classical mechanics here. Uh, expert in this area, uh, Caroline Lasser, gave a talk yesterday, then Heller, Lil John, Miller, Hagedon, and other people. I mean, these are solid and robust techniques which have different names. One sometimes talks about the thawed, uh, the thawed snowball approximation, but whatever you can use the terminology you like. So I assume that the Hamiltonian H is twice continuously differentiable in Z and continuously differentiable in time. And we fix a reference point z naught in phase space and denote by zt the solution to Hamilton's equations for h with initial datum that reference point. So the nearby orbit approximation consists in replacing h, which is with its truncated Taylor expansion, h, h naught here. That is, we have the right hand side is a part consists of the three first time of the Taylor series of H naught expanded around Zt here. Actually, you can very easily calculate the approximate solution here. It's given by the formula ut equal to Zt plus st Z naught times u naught minus z naught. What is st Z naught? St Z naught is a um, symplectic matrix, which is the Jacobian matrix of the true flow at the point Z naught. 
here. Notice that if you take u naught equal to z naught, that is, if you take the original point equal to the reference point, then you get ut equal to zt, that is, you get exactly the reference orbit. That is, this, hem this uh, truncated Hamiltonian, Hamiltonian's flow is the exact flow at the point, uh, with, at the trajectory with initial value z naught here. Um, yeah, the approximate solution is about 10 minutes left, Maurice. How many? Uh, about 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Oh, thank you. So I do it a little bit uh, faster than here. Okay. Well, anyway, using this particular Hamiltonian and the associated flow, you can also study the chalkboard motion for arbitrary Hamiltonians taken in account to the fact that the smaller epsilon is, the better the approximation will be. Okay, perhaps I do not insist on that point here, but rather talk about Hamiltonian subsystems then here. So I consider a bipartite Hamiltonian system consisting of two parts, A and B, with phase spaces R2 and A and R2 and B here. So the Hamiltonian functions are, are HA and HB. So if these Hamiltonians or if the subsystems do not interact with each other, the time evolution of A union B can be predicted by solving separately the Hamiltonian equations, which we have here. This is, of course, trivial. We have two uncoupled systems. But in the more general case, you have two systems A and B interacting. Uh, so the Hamiltonian will be H equal to HA plus HB plus an interaction part here. Uh, such Hamilton functions frequently appear in molecule, molecular dynamics, the Kepler problem, and so on, so on, so on, so on. And they are uh, as difficult to solve as any Hamiltonian system is. It turns out that hmm, the solutions for HA and those for HB does not help us very much in finding the general solution here. But, 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 is something which uh, has to do with the chalkboard motion here. We have a extended symplectic camel result as it's called here that is if we consider the orthogonal projection pi a of the full phase space on the phase space of the subsystem a then there exists a symplectic matrix in r to n a such that for every r larger than zero you have the inclusion 17 here and more generally for balls with arbitrary center z naught, you have the inclusion 18. This means that the projection of a ball, of a symplectic ball, that is of the deformation of a ball by a symplectic matrix, cannot become arbitrarily small. Uh, that's why it is a generalization of the symplectic camel theorem of Gromov's theorem here. Okay, this has been proved by Abordandolo and Matiev and uh, by me using different methods. What has, what does this have to do here with what we do here? Uh, yeah, good. It has to do simply with the fact that we can generalize formula 19 here for a linear flow to the nearby orbit method. Well, I will not have time to go to, into the details, but this inclusion allows you to study the evolution of entropy, for instance, in a subsystem. And also in the quantum case, to study the mixedness of the partial quantum system and all that. Yes, I've been a little bit too slow here. So quickly, a few words about the quantum case. Uh, I take a Goldstein quantum state, that is a state with the Wigner distribution of the type 20 here. It has to satisfy a certain quantum condition, which is equivalent to the robertson schrodinger inequalities. This is well known here. Okay, the covariance ellipsoid of the state is by definition what is given here in formula omega here. And, 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 now let's specialize. If we take a pure state here, psi xy, that's a pure Gauss in a generalized squeeze coherent state here, then the matrix S corresponding to the ellipsoid omega is of the type 25 here. And it turns out that this is a local symplectic matrix. So we can apply the whole machinery to the study of, of such uh, 
of uh, the, the quantum uh, propagation of that such Gaussian states here. And actually, uh, the mm, yeah, well, here I will not have time to go further here. So I define the metaplectic group here, which is, of course, well known. And then the local metaplectic group, which is yeah, which is generated by the so-called uh, chirps here and uh, by unitary rescalings. And it turns out that all pure Gaussian states can be obtained from the st standard fiducial coherent state using only the local metaplectic group MP not N. So this is important and this has developments in the chalkboard motions then of Gaussian is if you take a totally arbitrary Gaussian psi x y, you can obtain it from the standard Gaussian here using only elements from the local metaplectic group. Let's see if I have time to. Yeah, good. Here I have here, and the local metaplectic group M P naught n acts transitively on the set of all centered Gaussians. And in fact, two Gaussians, psi x, y, and psi x prime, y prime, are related by this formula here, where L double prime and P double prime are easily calculated, and and so on and so on. So perhaps it's better when if I stop here, there are also applications here to subsystems. Here uh, you can calculate the increase in entropy and purity also using these results here. And well, okay, so what I have outlined here could be useful in celestial mechanics. Scheres in Boulder has used uh, this to analyze uh, planetary motion and satellite motions. In entropy, Kalogeropoulos has applied this or the non squeezing theorem to study various notions of entropy and study of subsystems of Hamiltonian systems both classical and quantum. Hmm. This is something I'm working on right now, so it's only work in progress. Well, thank you for your attention then. Thank you very much, Maurice, for a fascinating talk and an impressive sprint to the finish there. Yeah, uh, well, yes, I'm, I'm a little bit sorry for that, I should have. I think, I think we have time actually for one or two questions. Uh, so, uh, Ches, uh, uh, if anyone's got any questions, kind of uh, let me know or just start talking, really. Uh, but, I mean, if not, I, I, I kind of have a question. Uh, it, might, it, it, it might be the incredibly naive question of a physicist, I'm afraid. Yes. Um, but it seems like, okay, what you've demonstrated is that any trajectory can be, if you like, assigned a Hamiltonian to describe yep. motion. But yes. what about in the case of kind of, you know, we, we know that, you know, you have non-Hamiltonian dynamics sometimes. So if you took a set of trajectories generated by that, what is, uh, you know, what happens? Is it just that each individual trajectory has its own Hamiltonian or is there some way of kind of describing? Yes, I think it's that. You, you see, the, these arguments are local. That is, they apply locally. What I mentioned a moment ago is that there is a result of Boothby, uh, which is not so, so well, well known. It says basically, if you take n points or let's say, M point in phase space, mm -hmm. Z naught, Z M, and then M other points in phase space, where really at random, you can always find a Hamiltonian whose flow takes the first M points to the M other points. It seems counterintuitive because it seems to violate conservation of volume, but it does not. So it, using that kind of theorem could be perhaps something uh, which, uh, which could answer your question, yes. But I don't know. <laughs> um, uh, so, so it looks like we've got kind of two more questions. Um, I think kind of maybe we can have one more now and then perhaps move it to the break uh, for any others. Uh, Caroline, do you have a question? Uh, yes, I do. <laughs> so thank you. Hi, Maurice. Hi, Caroline. Hi. <laughs> uh, I, I guess, you can guess what my question would be. So in your sprint at the end, you had that this wonderful construction of uh, for the dynamics of, uh, of, of coherent states. So do you think this theoretical setup would survive the addition of polynomials 
you know, Hagedorn like polynomials in front of the Gaussian amplitude that you also pull up that is on a normal basis. Hermit type yeah. functions, things like that. Yes. Yeah. Yes, and I'm working for that, yes, and I think it works, yes, definitely. Yeah, that would be highly interesting, you know, because then you would have an orthonormal basis and really could go up in the whole space. Absolutely, and there's another trick which can be used to deal with that case, by the way, the Fermi's, Fermi's tree trick. We could discuss that. <laughs> yeah, okay, so thanks for, for a positive answer, but I will ask again in more detail. Then. Of course. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.